In October 2004, Yasser Arafat fell ill. One month later, he was dead. No one could find the root cause. I'm Clayton Swisher. My initial investigation suggested the Palestinian leader was poisoned with radioactive material. It triggered the exhumation of Arafat's body for testing, and it sparked a French murder inquiry. It's a very complicated case. It has politics, intelligence, conspiracies. In the search for the facts, we've faced fierce opposition. And we've been placed under close surveillance. Are you following me? Go to your room. But now, we have the final results. And our investigation answers a question that's haunted the Middle East for nearly a decade. What killed Yasser Arafat? What we've got now is definitely a smoking gun. You revealed the crime of the century. When Yasser Arafat died in 2004, most Palestinians thought it was murder. But when he was buried, so were the answers to their questions. Today, the Palestinian leadership insists Yasser Arafat was killed. The murder of Arafat, and it is a murder, even though we don't yet know exactly who, where, when, he couldn't have shrunk and, and died uh, without a substance that they could not identify. Ever since President Arafat died, in my heart, I knew he was killed. Well, there was clear evidence uh, that this was a case of assassination, that Arafat was uh, actually killed uh, by, uh, by poison. Nasser Kidwa is Arafat's nephew, and in 2004 was also the Palestinian Authority's foreign minister. As Arafat lay dying in this room at the Percy Military Hospital in France, both he and the Palestinian chief negotiator suspected foul play. What they did about it in November 2004 has remained a secret until now. One night, I think it was the fourth or the fifth, two o'clock in the morning, uh, Dr. Nasser Kudwe, a very close friend of mine, called me from Paris to my home, Jericho, and said, Sir, please call the Americans and tell them to ask the Israelis to give us the antidote. And I did. I called their consul general and I told him, please, if the man, uh, President Arafat's health is deteriorating, we suspect he was poisoned. So please, if you can contact the Israelis and get us the antidote, we will appreciate it. This, this is a true story. But if the Palestinian leadership were privately seeking an antidote, it's exactly the opposite of what they were telling the public at the time. The doctors today ruled out completely poisoning. So we can also rule out that cause as well. Although Arafat died of a brain hemorrhage, no one could determine the root cause of the illness that led to his death in just 31 days. Hours after Arafat died, French officials issued a death certificate. His body was washed and presented to the Palestinian Authority who escorted it back to Ramallah. Despite saying now that they thought it was murder, the Palestinian Authority met and chose not to do an autopsy. The French did not really encourage uh, an autopsy. And you know, uh, uh, it's, it's not easy to uh, cut up the, the corpse of your historical leader. Information that we now know to be false was also fed to the global media. First of all, I want to set the record straight about the subject of the autopsy. All the newspapers were saying all over the world that she refused an autopsy. Did you ever at any moment in time consider uh, ordering an autopsy of your late husband's body? No, it never occurred to me in the beginning. Did the doctors ever ask you 
and, and say to you, Suha, maybe we should do this. No. I recommend nobody. an autopsy. No, nobody. Not one of the doctors. Not one of the doctors, nobody. Nobody asked No me. one suggested no it. One no one suggested. recommended it. No, because it was said that somebody suggested autopsy for me and I refused, never. I don't think that the issue of autopsy came up. And I would repeat here that it's not true uh, that Suha uh, 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 refused, refused that. While the Palestinian Authority failed to order an autopsy, they went on to form their own commission of inquiry. And after eight years, it turned up nothing. Whether the investigation that were held did their job properly or not is something that I'm sure that history will judge. Obviously, things changed drastically when Al Jazeera declared much later, much, much later, that it could have been polonium. Now, polonium definitely was not in anybody's mind at the time. Arafat's body had no sign whatsoever. Eyebrow raising new claims about the death of Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. Al Jazeera reignited the controversy surrounding Arafat's death. Litvinenko was the first. Now there are allegations that there may have been another. High levels of polonium-210 on Mr. Arafat's clothes. The evidence can simply disappear. Well, we're going to have to dig Arafat up to find that out for true, and this could tip over politics in that part of the world. Nobody can predict uh, what may or may not come of uh, such action. Ramallah. The occupied West Bank. July 2012. This is the tomb that houses Yasser Arafat's body. It also holds the key to finding out if the Palestinian leader was poisoned with the radioactive element, polonium-210. Although polonium is one of the deadliest substances known to man, it disappears quickly, by 50% every 138 days. So scientists need to exhume Arafat's corpse and quickly begin their specialized tests. We have to do it quite fast because polonium is decaying. So if we wait too long, for sure, any possible proof will disappear. Based on their projections, the scientists set a deadline of the end of 2012 to do the exhumation. Doha, Qatar, July 3rd. The story has just broken. Arafat's widow, Suha, is leading a campaign to get her husband's body exhumed. Time is not on her side, and neither is her late husband's nephew. I think that what was given to the Jazeera was enough, because when it is said, and in a scientific way, from a Swiss newspaper, that there is a certain amount of polonium in a certain level. This is not a natural thing, and it is not a natural thing. And it is a clear reason for Despite the opposition, Suha presses on. You know, Nasser uh, is a diplomat. Uh, I am the wife. Uh, for me, it's, uh, there's a difference. I respect his opinion, but my opinion is I don't want any 1% doubt about this story. I want to reveal this for the whole world. And this is my, will be my battle. Paris, France, July 6th, three days since we broke the story. The Palestinian Authority praises Al Jazeera's film and recommits itself to discovering the truth. Its leader, Mahmoud Abbas, arrives to hold his first official meeting with the new French president, Francois Hollande. He presented to him with the new facts of the Al Jazeera documentary and urged him if they have any things they haven't told us to please forward to us. July 10th, Arafat's widow Suha arrives in France. She believes pursuing a criminal investigation in the country where her husband died and where she's also a citizen is the quickest way to the truth. Her lawyers explain the options. I just met with uh, one of the best criminal lawyers in uh, Paris, and uh, we agreed that we have to go further with the file. It's a criminal file now. We have to establish that crime was committed against this man. It's a very complicated case. It has politics, intelligence, conspiracies, 
and interests from all sides of the equation. So it is not an easy case. Doha, Qatar, July 22nd. The Palestinian delegation attends an Arab League meeting. Mahmoud Abbas's office has refused repeated requests for an interview. President Abbas, Al Jazeera English. How are you? Is the Arab League going to investigate Yasser Arafat's suspicious death? The Palestinian Authority leader goes on to propose his own rival plan to establish the facts. He will officially request to begin the formation of an international commission to follow up the matter. We need to go to the Security Council. The Palestinian Authority wants to persuade the United Nations to take the case. Our motion, backed with the findings of the Jazeera documentary, has a very, very strong valid chances of passing. Paris, July 31st. Suha Arafat and her lawyers disagree with the Palestinian Authority. They believe the United Nations will work too slowly, losing critical evidence in the meantime. We cannot wait forever, as the evidence and the strength of the poison will reduce immensely by each day, by each hour. Suha and her legal team decide to take matters into their own hands, filing a criminal complaint directly to a French judge. August 28th, the investigating magistrate gives an answer. Breaking news from Europe. Today, French prosecutors opened an inquiry to find out whether he was murdered. Yasser a murder investigation into whether Yasser Arafat was poisoned. In fact, Arafat died, remember, in 2004 in Paris. September 14th. Three judges are now in charge of a French legal case that could become a murder trial. Their first action is to summon Sua Arafat to court. The first question, what do you know about the last meal of uh, Yasser Arafat? So I said, uh, I know nothing about the last meal of Yasser Arafat because I was not there. September 25th, the Percy Military Hospital. French detectives searched the building where Arafat died, focusing on the labs that attested him. What astonished me uh, the most, you remember when you came, uh, we've met in Paris, uh, and I gave you uh, the official letter of Percy Hospital. They are uh, incapable to give us uh, any kind of uh, blood or urine samples because they have been destroyed. But they were not all destroyed, and French police discover some during the search. They got biological samples of his body, and it's more than 100 biological uh, samples. Despite the revelation, the cells that remain are not enough for radiological tests. Exhumation remains their only option, and for that, they will have to go to Ramallah. It's October 25th, 2012, Nearly four months have passed since our documentary aired where the Swiss scientists said that the exhumation of Yasser Arafat must take place as rapidly as possible. That clearly hasn't happened yet. The mausoleum and grave of Yasser Arafat just behind me still is untouched. It's our first day here, but already we're facing problems. <laughs> We have permission to film at Yasser Arafat's grave. But while we are shooting, presidential guards step in. After some discussion, they insist we move back. The next day, security forces tell us we cannot film at all. We're told the French are going to come to President Arafat's grave today to start taking measurements and coming up with a plan to exhume his body. But the Palestinian Authority and the French refuse to allow our cameras access. So we've set up this camera in a van 300 meters away with direct line of sight to observe and monitor who goes in and who goes out of President Arafat's mausoleum. In the end, the French forensic investigators never turn up. November 5th, 
we spot the Swiss forensic team crossing an Israeli checkpoint into the West Bank. Later that day, we observe them visiting Arafat's tomb. We try to film them, but once again, the secret police are not happy to see us. Hey, what? He told me now we know. Excuse me, now no. Huh? What's he asking for? Who's this? Now, now, secret. We're again told to leave. The Swiss scientists return at dusk and take measurements from the Earth. We track them down to this hotel, but we cannot approach them with security guards present, so we speak with them outside their rooms. We are not allowed to to speak with you, George. <laughs> the, the, the authority did, or the, the authority is, so, uh... Within moments, the guards arrive. Another time, a small police, okay? okay. November 10th, it's the eve of the eighth anniversary of Arafat's death. The foundation Nasser Kid was set up in his name is hosting an event. The guest list is a who's who of Arafat's former staff and advisors, as well as leading politicians. Some are reluctant to discuss the exhumation. Prime Minister, how are you? I'm all right, thank you. Will the, po will the Palestinian Authority allow the exhumation of President Arafat's body? The man leading the Palestinian investigation and coordinating the exhumation is Tafik Tarawi. Most recently, he has been telling the press that they may even block access to the body. Will the French still be allowed to do their tests? If not, if we agree. Huh. If not, isn't it? No. Then we'll never know the truth. I'm a Sayyid here. I'm a Sahib of Sayyid here. No one will force me to do this. Inside, before a packed auditorium, Nasser Kidwa makes his strongest appeal yet to stop the exhumation. That night, the senior Palestinian leadership sit down to decide on what to do. Despite Kidwa's pleas, they finally agree to exhume Arafat's body with all the consequences it may bring. November 11th, the Palestinian Authority marks eight years since Arafat's death. Mahmoud Abbas will use the commemoration to announce the decision to exhume. Nasser Kidwa is scheduled to speak. But first, there's a heated exchange with Tawfiq Tarawi, and then with Saab Arakat, and finally with President Abbas himself. In the end, Kidwa chooses not to give a speech at all. President Abbas will do all the talking. <laughs> This is the first time we have heard anything about a Russian investigation. The Palestinian Authority has invited forensic experts from Moscow. It is perhaps because they are skeptical of the French, who claim to have destroyed but later found Yasser Arafat's samples. And they see the Swiss scientists as linked to Al Jazeera. Mohamed Darame is a journalist who's covered the Palestinian Authority for decades. He explains their hostility. I met with seniors who believed that Al Jazeera did it intentionally to, to create an Arab Spring here in Palestine. They, they had these fears that Al Jazeera uh, is trying to play in our yard. But in spite of any perceived political games, the Palestinians are still agreed on the exhumation, except for Nasser Kidwa. There is much better and more effective way uh, to try to do an extra step 
if it is needed, and it's not by exhuming the budget. Are you more satisfied with the approach that President Abbas outlaid today, where there'll be French, Swiss, and Russian investigators coming? I'm not in favor of exhuming the body in principle. November 12th. With the decision made, the Palestinian Authority starts preparing the ground, ensuring their work is hidden from public view. November 13th. We realize we're being followed. They are talking on two-way microphones, coordinating with other cars. Um, if they are trying to be discreet, it's not really working, but they may just be trying to intimidate us. We stage bogus journeys around Ramallah. During the first, a silver vehicle pursues our cameraman. On the second, we're tailed by a black car. The giveaway is when we get to the roundabout. Keep going around, let's. And it happens again with a different vehicle. One more time, one more time, one more time. Yep, there we go. Now that's not obvious, we're going in a circle and they're still going in a circle. Knowing we're being tailed and fearing the agents may go further, we conceal a camera in a bag in our room. While we are out, it is triggered by a man in a hotel uniform. He has tools and appears to adjust something near our equipment. Minutes later, two others come in and actually make the bed. But then, another person arrives and searches our bag. We recognize him. He's the driver of the black car. Later on, our cameraman confronts him. Why, why are you following me? Yeah. Why are you following me? Yeah. I've seen you following me. Today and yesterday, you were following me. Yeah. It's okay? How are you doing? Yeah, and you follow me today? Yeah, I've seen you with my eyes. The Palestinian Authority is going to great lengths to investigate the journalist behind the story rather than the story itself. But why? We identify a fifth person who entered our room and find him later outside the hotel. That is exactly the guy. Stop, stop. Stop the car. How's it going, guys? Whoa! No, 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 no. You know what? Yes. Why are you following us? Who are you? Go, go. No, I'm right here. You following me? Go to your room. Go, go, go to your room. The Palestinian Authority is anxious. Say, don't speak with me, okay? okay. Don't speak with me. Why not? I call the police. Call the police. Oh, okay, go. You're broken the law. You're me. There is little time left to discover what killed Yasser Arafat. Are you following me? And the Palestinian Authority knows the truth could have profound implications for its future, as well as that of the Middle East. Who are you? Were you in this hotel? Movin Pick Hotel, Ramallah, November 19th. Palestinian security forces have tailed our cars and searched our rooms. When we confront them, they insist they're with the hotel. I tell him I am security in the hotel, not no, I am working in the hotel. You are not in the, you are not host from the hotel. Yeah, yeah, not the hotel. Don't make a when the manager confirms they are not his employees, we know they are spying on us. And at a time when the deadline is fast approaching to get Yasser Arafat's body exhumed and tested. Show small. Show small? Yeah. Maila. Oh, you don't have a name. Maila. Breaking into your rooms, following your cars. The Palestinian Authority is uh, growing nervous with the media. Any Palestinian would tell you that the Israelis killed Arafat. But uh, when you ask him further questions, of course, he would think that some Palestinian around Arafat was the tool. Arafat spent his final years under siege in his compound. 
He died while in a jail enforced by the Israelis. He died while every substance that he imbibed came through the Israelis. He died while even his water came through the Israelis. His medicines came through the Israelis. He was not free of the Israelis when he died. But it was Arafat's inner circle who had final control over access, food, and medicine. They were his last line of defense. So the Palestinian Authority's anxiety could stem from the possibility that one of his closest aides may have also conspired to kill him. If the poison is a much more like a conventional poison that had to be put uh, in his food after uh, it, it has arrived, then it could have possibly been an, a, a collaborator. The fear of finding an enemy within may also explain why they avoided an autopsy back in 2004. One of the excuses given at the time was that it would have been prohibited under Islam. That was false. Sheikh Taysir Tamimi was Arafat's trusted cleric and was the last man to touch his body before its burial. Our investigation has revealed that Palestinian leaders made a deliberate decision not to conduct an autopsy. They believe they were sacrificing the truth for a greater cause. What would the implications have been? Had an autopsy been done, had they had found poison in President Arafat's body? If, if, if this had happened, I would think that it would have meant uh, the end of uh, uh, the, uh, the peace process as it stood at that time. Because? Because the Palestinian people would have, uh, uh, would have seen with their own eyes a huge betrayal and uh, a, a big crime committed against them, the crime of killing their own, uh, their own leader. So they waved goodbye to Arafat, as well as the opportunity to obtain material evidence that their leader was murdered. We all cried our hearts for the death of our leader, obviously. It was a tragedy to us. But the question really then was how to continue, how to move on. And that is really the question that needed to be tackled at the time. But did they go beyond avoiding the truth to actively covering it up? No, I think this is really a, a, a bizarre and sinister assumption. We felt that going into, into an autopsy would really make it very difficult for the people and very difficult for the memory of Arafat and would turn what is a martyrdom case into a police criminal case. And really people were not really ready, at least in, in, in our mind, for turning this into a criminal police case. Nine years later, whether they wanted it or not, it has become a criminal case. Lausanne, November 23rd. It was the work of these Swiss scientists that opened the door to a French murder investigation. Having visited Ramallah once already, they're now preparing to head back for the exhumation. It will prove once and for all whether or not the Palestinian leader was poisoned with polonium-210. To be honest, we, we are not going to Ramallah being totally confident in finding uh, polonium. It's actually the opposite. We, we waited for a long time. The polonium, if it is present, is decaying fast. The Swiss set a deadline of the end of 2012 for the exhumation. It's now late November, and although it looks like they're going to get the samples in time, it's going to be close. Time is also running out for the separate murder investigation that was initiated by French prosecutors. Paris, Charles de Gaulle Airport, November 25th. The French have refused to disclose any details of their investigation, but we track down their team of judges and forensic experts as they begin the journey to Ramallah. Along with the Swiss and Russian teams, the French will receive tissue from Arafat's body for analysis. Ramallah, November 26th. It's the eve of the exhumation and three teams are on the ground. 
there are the Swiss scientists whose initial analysis of Arafat's belongings for Al Jazeera suggested polonium poisoning. There are the French judges and forensic experts who were assigned to the case when France later opened a murder investigation. And there is a Russian team, personally invited by President Abbas at the very last moment. Each team is required to follow the strict terms of their host. The Palestinian Authority insists that only one man is allowed to touch the body or take samples. They designate a university pathologist, Dr. Sabr Alalul. He first met Arafat as a medical student, and the PLO helped finance his studies. Dr. Alalul makes one final inspection at the mausoleum. Later, the Swiss, French, and Russian forensic teams join him. At around midnight, workmen start digging. And at 5 a.m., they open the tomb. November 27th. Day breaks, along with the news that the exhumation has gone according to plan. The body of former Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat exhumed today. His grave in Ramallah was opened. Transformed into a scene right out of CSI. Opening the late the experts will examine the sample for possible traces of poison. Results of the test are not expected for months. The doctor has distributed 60 samples. The Swiss, French, and Russian teams leave with 20 each. They also have DNA to confirm the corpse's Arafats. So 147 days have passed since the broadcast of our film, What Killed Arafat. The Swiss scientist said to Miss Arafat the conclusion that if she wanted to know the final proof, the best way was to exhume the body and take samples. They've done that just now, and it'll be several more months till we know the results. At a press conference the same day, Tawfiq Tarawi vows that if the results are positive, the Palestinian Authority will take their case to the International Criminal Court. Washington, April 29, 2013. The chances that Arafat's case will ever see The Hague greatly diminish. Arab leaders have come to support negotiations with Israel. And as a condition to get started, the Palestinian Authority agrees to suspend any attempts to join the International Criminal Court. Malta, June 15, 2013. Almost seven months have passed since the samples were taken. Scientists are still carrying out their complex tests. To some, Yasser Arafat was a leader and a hero. To others, an enemy and a terrorist. But he was also a husband and a father. His daughter Zawa was just eight when he died. She's now 17. 
and the memories are still vivid. I woke up one morning and I saw my family members sitting in the, in the living room in black, all crying. And at the time, I knew that my mom went and to see my dad. And then they told me, Zahwa, come, come sit. Then, um, my uncle gave me the phone, and it was my mom. And she didn't have to say anything. I just burst into tears. And I said to my mom that he really died. And she said yes. And then I cried. I went to my room. I went to Carol for the funeral. There was my mom and millions of people behind us. When I saw the coffin ar arriving and the music behind it, the Palestinian national anthem, I started crying. I burst into tears. Zawa grew up in four different countries, never knowing what had killed her father. I was only eight, so I didn't really understand what was going on. But slowly, slowly, I began to ask what happened to my father. Why, why did he die? Who killed him? If he, if somebody killed him, what happened? Why? As well as the uncertainty, she had to endure the taunts. That he was a terrorist, he was corrupt, he wasn't a good leader, he was homosexual, he had AIDS, all these things. Pretty soon, uh, my mom and I are going to get the results. I feel like just because I don't know what's going to happen, if, if, they're going, if the result will be negative or positive, but at the same time, I feel very excited because I will know, I will finally know what happened to him, what happened to my dad. Yerevan, a new development brings me to the Armenian capital. We were expecting results from Switzerland months ago, but the news from Luzan is that they will be delayed for more testing and verification. In the meantime, a man from the former Soviet Union contacts me online. He says he can access leaked findings from the Russian scientist study of Arafat's remains. The Palestinian Authority brought Russia in to conduct a third examination on top of the French and Swiss studies. But the Kremlin has refused any access to their scientists, so the leak could be significant. After months of communication, I decide to meet the source. He asked, and we agreed to hide his identity. We spend hours checking that neither of us is being followed, unsure of the risks of releasing classified material. He shows us 15 pages, said to be the summary findings from the Russian lab. After, we convince him to speak to us on camera. Это секретный документ, к которому имел доступ определенный очень узкий круг людей, не более 20 человек, которые работали в лаборатории. По словам сотрудников, которые работают в этой лаборатории, они получили четкую, четкие инструкции от Министерства иностранных дел, каким образом должен выглядеть финальный отчет. They were not only restricted in how they presented the report, they were also given an incomplete selection of samples. The document shows they measured only four of a total of 20. Что касается экземпляров, которые они изучали, то по словам сотрудников этой самой лаборатории, они получили всего четыре образца, которые были получены в рамках экскумации Ясера Арафата, и, соответственно, именно они их изучали. И это выглядело для сотрудников подозрительно, что их просят заполнить конкретную таблицу из и ответить на конкретные вопросы министерства иностранных дел, провести неполноценные исследования. It's not clear what happened to the other 16 samples. In the four that were tested, the readings of polonium-210 in Arafat's bones are unusually low, even less than what scientists would expect from background levels. Nonetheless, the scientists write that the results are inconclusive. Это очень русский подход, российский подход угодить всем. В этой ситуации задача России была выполнить просьбу палестинской автономии, 
и в этой ситуации своей помощью не обидеть Израиль и не создать новую горячую точку на карте Ближнего Востока. Поэтому здесь задача была сделать вывод без вывода. Geneva, Switzerland, November 4th. It's the eve of the results, and the Swiss are finally ready to present the exhumation report. It's been a long wait with a lot of delays, which we're told is owing to the complexity of their tests. Mrs. Arafat's attorney will meet with the Palestinian Authority and the Swiss tomorrow afternoon, but the Palestinian Authority has insisted Al Jazeera be frozen out. We cannot film or attend. Thanks for coming out to Geneva. No problem. Professor so Dave Barkley is also here. He's a leading forensic scientist with decades of experience in the British Crime Investigation Services. I'm sure this is going to be fascinating. And he's followed the case closely since the beginning of our investigation. I used the opportunity to show him the Russian report for his reaction to the 15 pages that reach an inconclusive conclusion. The choice of bone fragments that they've chosen to use is very odd, and the levels they've got appear to be 10 or 20 times less than you'd expect just from anybody else in the world. So I think the results are meaningless. November 5th. In Geneva, the Arafat family lawyer, Saad Jabbar, sets off. He will collect the final report along with the Palestinian Authority after a presentation from the Swiss scientists. In Paris, Arafat's widow and daughter, Suha and Zawa, wait and wonder what the findings will be. For them, this day is the climax of a two-year fight for the facts and nearly a decade of not knowing. Hours later, and Sajibar has received the report. He meets up with Professor Barkley, and the two men begin the journey to Paris to deliver the findings. For four hours, they pore over the details of the report, preparing to explain its significance. As the Paris evening draws in, it's a tense wait for Suha and Zawa. They hope the study will offer more answers to their questions. By late evening, Sajibar and Professor Barkley make it to Paris, ready to break the news. You are mostly welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. My principal task is to look at, take a forensic overview of cases. I've been through that in great detail, and I hope I can now explain to you its conclusions. If you remember back in last year, we found the presence of polonium-210 in various body fluids from things taken at the time. The results were very high, and in my view, not only were they very high, but the pattern of those results in, there was a urine stain, if you remember, and a blood stain and so on, could not be manipulated in any way. You couldn't have fiddled it. Had you kept the samples in your possession for five or six years, nothing you could have done would have manufactured those results. This year, we've been working on samples from the exhumation itself, and there are very high levels also in his bone and uh, fluid that came down as his body was lying. And those patterns, too, are not only very high, but they are characteristic of him having a dose of polonium just before he died. So those levels are about 36 times what you'd expect in a normal person. All the samples from um, Yasser Arafat are way above those from other people. Um, one other thing points to this being an assassination. You can calculate what the level should be in those stains and in his bones, assuming he had been given a fatal dose way back in 2004. When you do that calculation, you get a, a figure which might be the cause of his death. And the figures we get from him, when we actually observe them, are smack in the middle of what they should be if he was given a fatal dose. So nothing we've got suggests that this is other than an administration of polonium which has caused the death of Yasser Arafat. 
can you hold your hand out? And just that, the amount of polonium in that ink would be enough to kill you. So it is so easy to get polonium into somebody in drink, uh, maybe a tenth of one grain of sugar would be enough. How strong is this Evans in legal terms? And it's unusually strong because everything was perfect from the exhumation all the way to the lab. The labs themselves are the very best in the world. So I don't have any doubt that we had a smoking gun back a year ago. Now I'm absolutely certain. This is beyond any doubt, in my opinion, that it was polonium that caused the death of Yasser Arafat. And we had a smoking gun. We've just got to find out, as you suggested, who was holding that gun. I think so. you, re you revealed the crime of the century. Revealed the crime of the century. It would be nice to solve it too. Yes. I think the Palestinian Authority has to go till the end to know the truth about it. And I think they have to stop any kind of negotiations uh, with Israel uh, until they know what's going on, who did it, why they, why, I don't know who did it, but I mean, they have to take a, a very firm measures to begin a very, very serious investigation uh, for, this, uh, for this crime. For Suhan Zawa, their faith now has to rest here at the gates of the French justice system. The murder inquiry in Paris remains the best hope for finding out who killed Yasser Arafat. Now that the results are known, this is a French case, and it is for the French judiciary to take their own decision. Any judge will conclude that there is a case to consider that Arafat was assassinated. And they have to start the process of trying to find out who did it. Once the French investigation is done, there is the option of the International Criminal Court. But that remains a distant prospect. Today, we know what killed Yasser Arafat. The question now for Suha and Zawa, for the French investigators, and for the world, is who killed him?